Okay. So thank you everyone for joining today um, for our webinar with John McLean. We're so excited to have him. Um, John is an interior designer, author, and business coach. Um, and today he's going to teach you how to take the scary out of selling, which I think is a very timely topic. And it's going to be super, super interesting to learn from him. Um, he's got some great experience and I'm just really excited. Um, so welcome, John. And I'll pass it over to you. Hi, thank you so much. So don't, I want everybody to not be scared at all today. This is going to be a fun uh, presentation. I hope that you learn something from it. I have been doing sales for way too long, more than I even want to admit, but um, I do hope that you just put on your open listening ears and learn some new things today. So I first want to talk to you about a quick little story about myself. So as you can see in this photo, uh, this is me and Vern Yip. We're both much younger in this photo. And this was my first time doing professional design, I guess you would say. And this was on, and, and by the way, it was on, it was on television. So there you go. Uh, so if anybody's ever scared about a presentation, try doing it on national TV for the first time. So Vern and I are uh, doing this television show. And then um, it is, it is my, again, my first time on TV, they kind of threw me into a situation and I'm supposed to design for a client, right? So I'm sent a, uh, DVD at the time. That's how we did it back then. Um, sent a, at least it wasn't a videotape, right? Um, so I'm sent a DVD and I'm watching it and I'm learning about what the clients want and they're giving me ideas. And she uses this term called milky a lot, which I didn't even know was a great term to use in design at the time. And so I am no, I will not allow her to have what she wants. I am hell bent on bringing color to this home because I felt that, you know, selfishly, I felt that color was going to be the way to get me noticed on television. It was going to have a pop to it. It was going to get everybody excited. And so I just threw away everything that that poor client was telling me in this probably 45 minute recording that they did telling me everything that they wanted. So fast forward, we're on the first day of filming. I go into the presentation mode that I'm in. And by the way, my presentation was pretty shoddy back then. It was just a folder with a bunch of printouts in it. And so I go into the presentation and I pull out all these ideas, these colors, these, these beautiful uh, images that I want to bring into the room, blues and oranges and all the things. And the client says, no, she literally freaks out. So this is what I've become. And I thought the gingerbread was perfect for the season right now. But I am literally terrified. I'm on the spot. The cameras are on me, like three cameras. And I'm having to decide what I'm going to do now because I have not listened to a word of, or maybe 10% of what this client wanted. And the rest of it was what I wanted. And I knew, you know, right then and there that I had approached this in the wrong way. So that night, you guys, I had to stop reading my entire presentation. And I only had three days to fulfill the design for this room. So it, this was a Monday and the reveal was on Friday. And so we had three days in the middle to do that, right? So I had to completely redo my whole plan. I pulled out the video again and watched the DVD that they had sent me and actually listened this time. What a novel idea. And I implemented uh, a new design with all of the things that they had asked for. Uh, imagine that if you actually listen to whom you're speaking with, you can actually come up with a better solution. What a novel idea. So uh, I'll make this ending short. So we get to the end of the uh, filming. And by the way, I don't get to do a second presentation for this client. It is literally just um, me doing the room based on what I thought it should be now that I listened. And then there are the cameras rolling on Friday and then we're gonna do the, the big reveal. So I'm in the room, sweaty palms, you know, nervous as I can be. They're outside the door and the door opens, the camera's on them, the camera's on me. And then they are, happy. They actually liked the room. So what I did was found a compromise between what she had asked for, which was all the color, I mean, all the neutrals, and then I wanted the color. So I found a balance between that. And I just sort of scattered a little bit of color throughout the room. So I was able to introduce my knowledge and my expertise and understanding what the room should and could look like, 
mixed with what she wanted the 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 wife in the scenario and because the as the husband said happy wife happy life in the episode and so they come in and they're super excited they get their their neutrals that they love but they see little additions of color throughout the room in ways that aren't too overpowering so i say this to say had I listened from the beginning, had I had I uh, written down notes and thought about what this client would need to be happy, then it would have changed the entire outcome and I wouldn't have been so stressed. So I apply this now. I think about this all the time and everything that I do with, with our clients now and with vendors now and with our team now. And it's always about not only listening to what they want, because they only know what they know, right? And we have to bring our ideas and our expertise to it, but we have to listen to what they want and then bring in things that we feel should be done as well. And then there is a happy medium in there and we're gonna talk about that. So I hope that's a lesson learned for you. Number one, don't design for the first time on national TV, but number two, listen to your clients. All right, here are our goals for today. And I'm calling this a course because I really do want you to think about this as if you're in a classroom and learning. So the first thing we're going to talk about is mindset management for sales. Mindset is a big, big part of whether you're doing great at selling or not. The next is the critical selling points for every designer. And these are points where uh, with your team, with your clients and with your trades and vendors, how the points where you would be selling something to them. Um, APS, I'm calling it autopilot selling now. So instead of always be selling, we're going to call it autopilot selling. We're going to set your selling on autopilot. And then I have my top four keys to selling that I feel boil this entire thing down. And so if there's anything to take away, it would be at that point. So this is me. I'm John McLean. If you've never heard of me before, I'm an interior designer. I have offices in Orlando, Florida and LA. And then I'm also a business coach. I'm helping designers uh, take their businesses to new levels. I'm a bit of a technology nerd, not an expert, but just a nerd, just enough to try everything out once to find out if I like it. Uh, I'm author of the Designer Within book, which you can see behind me, accidentally just in the background behind me, right? Uh, so I the, the book just came out in September and I'm super, super excited about it. And then I'm also the, the creator of the Designer Within business course which is courses for, as I mentioned, as a business coach for the design industry that teaches all of my systems and processes and has my agreements inside of it and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm a cupcake connoisseur. I've never met one cupcake that I did not like and could not find something good about. Uh, and as you can see by this photo, I'm a Dolly Parton fanboy, uh, so much so that I had this custom piece of art made. And this lady has inspired me in life and business. So I felt that she should be in this little introduction. So let's jump into mindset management for sales. This is so critical in determining whether you're going to be successful in any sales situation. But let's talk about what mindset is first. And I'm not going to get to woo-woo on you. I just want to talk about the mindset that you should have and to ask yourself which mindset you're actually in now and which one would benefit you more when you're actually performing a sales call with, with a client, with a vendor, or with your team. So mindset is a belief that orients the way we handle situations, the way we sort out what is going on and what we should do. Our mindsets help us spot opportunities, but they can also, aha, uh -huh, trap us in self-defeating cycles. Been there, done that, and I'm sure you have as well. Here are the two mindsets that we're going to focus on now. Fixed mindset versus the growth mindset. So I want you to look at this and ask yourself, which one are you? You know, of course, we all want to be the growth mindset where you're saying things like, I like to try new things. I can, I can learn to do what I want. My intelligence can be developed. My mistakes help me grow. Um, I know this will help me even though it is difficult. These are, this is that growth mindset that will allow you to propel yourself forward and succeed. Now, if you have a fixed mindset as an alternative, it's things like, I give up. My potential is predetermined. There is no point in trying. I will never improve. I'm not going to close this deal. I'm not going to con uh, convince this client to sign with us, you know, things like that. So ask yourself now, and I know we've all been in one of these at any given time, but when you're in a situation and the, your mindset is taking over and you feel defeat and you feel um, no way out and you feel kind of lost, ask yourself what you can do to turn that around and, and 
the key with mindset is identifying which mindset you're in. That's a critical part of it as well. And then moving up from there. So this is what makes a good salesperson. And I really hate that word salesperson, but in the, in the method of this course, I wanted to kind of use that as the term. And I will tell you this, this is actually a slide that I use for another course that I teach in my, in my courses um, for your CEO mindset. And as I was making this course for you guys and coming up with a slide that determined words that would describe a good salesperson, many, many of these words moved over from the CEO mindset, interestingly enough. So it is such a great correlation between being a good leader and being a good salesperson that I just left 99% of the words in here. So things like service-based, very important, great listener, mucho important, charismatic. You want to have personality when you're selling to someone. You want to have personality when you're telling everybody how great your company is and how your great your team is and why they should work with you. You want to be confident, decisive, bold, accountable. And then one of my favorites is transparent. We use transparency in our business in all aspects from clients to vendors to internal team uh, information. And I just want you to always come at everything with a with clarity and, and transparency. Next, we're going to talk about scarcity versus abundance. So these are specific mindsets that obviously you know which one you want to avoid and which one you want to embrace. So first, let's talk about the scarcity mindset. Ooh, The scarcity mindset, it leads to the belief that there are limited opportunities, options, and resources. So, so in other words, you feel limited. You feel that there's not enough clients in the world to, to, for you to get one on your own. You know that there are too many designers and not enough clients and that this client's not going to sign with you because of X, Y, and Z. So this scarcity mindset, it instantly limits you to even moving past the point of that first meeting, much less closing a deal. So, so ask yourself many times if you are in that scarcity mindset, and we're going to talk about ways to um, overcome that. Now, the abundance mindset on the other side is where we do want to be. So the abundance mindset is your belief that there are enough resources and successes for everybody to share. And, and so you always need to come from a place of abundance rather than scarcity, especially when you're dealing with clients or any sort of sales situation. Clients in particular can pick up on any insecurities that you have. Um, they, if you're going into a sales call and you're, and you're or with a meeting with a client, a consultation or a discovery call, and you're so nervous because, oh my gosh, I have to make payroll and I have to pay the rent on the office and oh my god i have to you know worse pay my mortgage so if you're going in there with all these worries in your head rather than coming in with the idea of serving that client you're you're going to instantly put that client on edge and i'm telling you the energy in a room during any cell situation is real it is palpable and if you bring in this negative feelings and emotions of concern and worry and scarcity mindset to any sales situation, it's going to bring it down instantly. And that person is going to not only feel timid and um, uninterested, they're just not going to listen to what you're saying. So, so be relaxed, be confident in yourself, be confident in your team. Clients want confident people. Everybody likes to work with confident people. And I can tell you this, if you sit down and think about all the ways that you have been successful and things that you're really good at, your confidence will increase. Okay. So do you have imposter syndrome? I hope you've, I hope you don't. And if you haven't heard of this term, we're going to talk about what it is, but it's not a good place to be either. So imposter syndrome includes feelings of self-doubt and personal incompetence that persists despite your education, experiences, and accomplishments. So you're this, you've had great projects, you've, you've, you've been in a magazine maybe, or maybe you had something published, or maybe you've done a speaking engagement, or any of these things that show the world and, and hopefully show yourself that you're good at what you do, but yet you still feel like you're not worthy of doing that. That is imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is nothing <laughs> that we ever want to have in any sort of sales situation. Because if you're faking it till you make it, that is not going to bode well for you and the client and the situation that you're in. So ask yourself, do you have imposter syndrome? And here are some of the signs of that. Do you feel that you just got lucky? This just happened to me accidentally. 
Um, is it hard to accept praise when someone says great job or this is beautiful or I love what you did? Do you find it hard? Do you shy away and sort of like, you know, sheepishly say thank you? Do you say I'm sorry a lot? Are you apologizing for things that may or may not be your fault? Do you try to be unrealistically perfect? Yes, you do, because I know I do as a designer and it is part of our industry that is so crippling to us sometimes. So find those moments when you're being unreal, unrealistically perfect and figure out why you're doing that. Is it to please someone else or is it just to continue to be uh, to please yourself or is it to be a people pleaser? Ask yourself. Does fear of trying paralyze you? So are you so scared of presenting something to someone, a client, a trace person, a vendor, a team member that you, you don't even do it? So you, you're so afraid of them saying no, that you don't even come up with this great idea. Maybe it's a trades person that you want to do uh, a, an out of the box design for, but you're afraid of showing it to them for fear of putting your heart on your sleeve and showing them your true creativity. So you just do something mundane and simple. So Ask yourself, is it stopping you from moving forward in, in so many different ways within your business and your life? And if it's paralyzing you, it's time to stop that and realize that you do have great things that you're bringing to the table and your value and experiences are worth it. Are you afraid of just being confident? So confidence is, again, it's very important to be confident in business and in life and people like working with confident people. But if you're afraid of being confident, then you're never going to express any sort of confidence level at all to anyone. So ask yourself, are you afraid of being confident and showing people that you do know what you're doing? Because I bet you that you totally do. You're a very competent person or you would not be in this industry because it is not an easy industry to be in. So you have done well and embrace that confidence. Here are ways to overcome your imposter syndrome. Acknowledge the thoughts and put them into perspective. So Understand what you're feeling and really ask yourself, is this a true thought or is this just my imposter syndrome coming into play? Share your feelings with others. Ask people in your industry, ask colleagues, ask other friends um, if they're feeling the same way. Sometimes it's just nice to hear that other people have those same emotions and, and worries and concerns because in this industry, unfortunately, some of us don't always share everything. We want to post that great highlight reel of social media, but we don't want to really show the authentic person that we are. And I found just by relaying my concerns with other people in my industry, with my colleagues, with trades and vendors, and even with my team members, that it does kind of bring that down and make me realize that, that we're all in the same boat and we do understand one another. As I said before, let go of perfectionism. It, is, it can be the most crippling thing that we do in, in any part of our industry, and especially when you're doing a, a sales-related presentation. But perfect, sometimes you just have to get it out there, right? So I, I have this little sticky note on my computer where it says, just get it out there. Because sometimes good enough is good enough. And you can just you can rearrange flowers only so many times to get them perfect. And you can redo a presentation only so many times. But I will tell you this, the message still gets across to the person receiving it. And the only thing you've lost is more time, more sweaty palms, more worrying about it when it really was not necessary. I also want you to celebrate your successes and past accomplishments. We have all had things, whether it's in the design industry that we're in now, or if you're like me, it's a second career, you can find things in your first industry that were successful for you and worked well for you. And even now, if you've been, again, if you've been published, if you just have a client who raves about you and refers you to everyone, celebrate these successes and recognize them because these are great things to build upon when you're feeling low and when you're feeling down. And I encourage you to even write down these past successes that you've had and they will build you up instantly. Keep that handy. Um, whether, whether it's an, written on your note, on your handwritten note or on your computer as a notepad, just keep something around to remind yourself of all the things that you have accomplished. All right, ways to create a selling mindset. And again, don't think of selling as a negative term. It is not at all. And we're going to talk about why. So know your strengths, know your superpowers and what sets you apart from other designers. Um, every designer can design, right? We can all do some sort of design. We're all good at something. We all have a certain aesthetic that we do. 
But ask yourself, what sets you apart? What makes you different than everybody else out there? And highlight that, put that on your website, make that a part of any sales pitch that you do, make that your elevator pitch where you include, you know, all of these things that you do so, so well. Us, for instance, I have a um, background, my family built homes. So I know the construction side of our industry. And somehow that worked its way into a conversation with a client one day. And it stuck. And I realized that clients love the fact that we have this knowledge of how their home is going to be renovated or how their new build home is going to be constructed. And I've, I've given that information as well. I've shared that with my team so that now my entire team is educated on that same um, factor. So clients love to know that we do know that part of it. And so for us, um, that is one of our superpowers. We, we do share that with clients and it instantly puts them at ease. So think about what you do that really sets you apart and it's something that you do so well that other people can't even match it. Um, change selling to serving. We've talked about selling so far, but I want you to think about serving rather than selling. How are you serving the needs of the person who is on the other side of that table that you're speaking with? Now, this next one might be a little hard, but listen 80% and serve 20%. Um, as I mentioned, you might remember with my little HGTV story, I was not listening whatsoever. I was, I was selling uh, 80% and, and listening maybe 20%. But when we're listening to people, we're, we're engaged, we're asking questions, we're finding out what their pain points are, which is very important. Pain points are the the thing, that one thing that will hold someone back from, from doing something that they really want to do. And it's that one thing that they that just sticks in their craw that they have to get done. So find out those pain points for clients, what really, really irritates them and the thing that really bothers them. And then that will help you to serve them better in that 20%. But I do encourage you to listen a lot. And lastly, find and embrace the best version of you. Be, be yourself. Be this person that is confident. Be that person who really believes in the value that you bring to a client and the value that you bring to the world and um, it believes in your vision as well. So you're being the leader of that of your company as the CEO of your company. So you want to share that vision with the world. And But to share that vision, you first must know that vision and you must know the values that you have. And, and lastly, <clears throat> I also like to be a chameleon of sorts with my clients. I like to not meld into what they are, their personality. But if you do sort of find that comfort level with listening to what they're saying and speaking with them in a way that they understand rather than using jargon of our industry, that will lead to a much more successful call. Now, this is really, by the way, the consultative selling method this is the key to everything that I'm speaking with you about today. This is the key to why it works for me. And this is the key to, I feel why it would work for you too. So the consultative selling method is, it kind of encapsulates everything that we've spoken about. You want to balance your questions with insight. So you want to balance all the things that you're asking with some sort of value that you bring to the conversation. You want to build knowledge-based trust. So this is trust based on what you know, and again, what you can bring to the table. So rather than telling the person that you're speaking with what they need, you ask them thought-provoking questions that help them identify, again, their pain points. We want to know what their pain points are. So by being this consultative seller, uh, selling technique, you are able to find out what their pain points are and serve them better. Keep it conversational and genuine. Don't go in with a spiel. Don't go in with it all written out exactly what you want to say. You know, you need to know the points that you want to cover, but don't go in like a robot. People want that nonchalant, that sort of friend talking to someone. I always try to put my uh, I, my ideal client in my head, that client that really has uh, loved what we have done, that has appreciated it. I always try to put that person in mind as I'm speaking with clients. And if you speak to people 
in, in the way that you want them to perceive it, then they will receive it in that way. And I feel that it just instantly lets their, their guard down. Take ownership of the conversation. Don't let things sort of you know, move on in, in 50 different directions. You're there for a reason. So make sure that you do keep the conversation on track because there's still a goal to be accomplished with that meeting. But you just wanna make sure that you are the leader in that conversation, not overpowering, but just the driver of the train, if you will. <clears throat> Um, let feedback guide the process. So if you are asking questions, which you should be, listen to what the answers are and then decide upon what your next uh, question will be after that or what the solution you will provide. But the feedback that this person is giving you in that moment is going to be the determining factor for what you say next. So again, if you go in like a robot and you're just speaking at the person rather than with the person, you're not going to get anywhere and you're they're going to feel left out. They're going to feel uninterested. They're going to feel like you're just bulldozing over top of them. And that is not going to lead to a successful resolution. Know your client's uh, your customer needs and offer relevant solutions. And I say customer here because the customer could be anyone that you're speaking with, but you need to know what they're needing. And with a client, for instance, this can be through a questionnaire. This can be through the discovery call. There are many ways to do that with your team members. It can be through annual reviews. It can be through how you onboarded them. But you want to know what they're needing, and then you want to offer solutions that you can provide to them. Now, there are times, by the way, when maybe you're not going to be the person to provide the solution. Maybe you don't even have the solution for them based upon what you offer uh, within your company and within how you operate your companies. And that's okay, because part of these are part of this process is also to determine who is going to be working with you and who is not. I tell clients on our on our very first consultation, if there's not a synergy, then um, we are not going to continue to work together. And I, I know that, that they appreciate that as well. Sorry, there's a dog barking in the background. Um, listen intently, uh, as we said before, listen 80% and serve 20%. That is really, really important. All right, let's talk about critical selling points for designers. There are the clients, the trades and vendors, and the internal team. So these are areas where you will always be selling in one way or another. Um, that dog is really going to town out there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> to sell to these people, however, you need to know who your ideal person is with each within each category. So know your ideal client. Know that that person is the person that you need to be working with. And here is the definition of an ideal client. Your ideal client is a person who finds their needs fulfilled with the services you offer your method of operations, and who has an appreciation and respect for your skills and knowledge. More so, an ideal client is someone that you generally enjoy working with, someone who allows you to use your talents and expertise in the most optimal way for project success, and who sees the value in their investment for exchange of services. Here are some points when you are selling to a client. So you have your initial potential client meeting. This is when you meet the client, whether or not it is at a party, whether or not it is with an introduction from someone at um, an event. This is that initial meeting where you should be selling the best part of yourself. You have the discovery call, of course, which we're all familiar with. And by the way, the point of the discovery call is to lead to the consultation. You're not selling them as a client on that discovery call. You're selling them as uh, you're going to sell them onto the consultation. So you're going to have the discovery call, find out their needs, and then you're going to move into the consultation. You're not trying to make them a client with that discovery call. Um, at the consultation, this is when you really should put on your best foot forward. You're in front of them. You're able to show them all the things that you can bring to the table to help them um, fulfill their project. So at, at our consultations, I like to provide deliverables. We're not just doing a meet and greet. We're doing an actual delivering consultation where we provide them with things that are takeaways. And if you approach every sell situation with providing takeaways and providing deliverables, you will be much more successful in closing that deal. Um, next is the design plan presentation. This is the presentation that you do with clients and you do that in front of them and you're trying to sell them on your design ideas. You also have your project delays and changes and price increases. These are those negative times when you're trying to convince that client that it's okay, that we got you. And I know we've all seen a lot of those lately where we've had to explain to clients why something was delayed. 
And lastly, there is the project closeout. This is where you're closing out the project and you really want them to be able to move on to the next phase and you want them to understand that you did a good job for them and to hopefully refer you. All right, let's talk about your ideal trade and vendor because we do have a selling point that we do with trades and vendors and our trades and vendors are our partners but there are times when we are selling to them. And if you're a trade and vendor watching this today, you're gonna to learn all of my techniques of how I like to work with you. So I still feel that you should have an ideal trade and vendor. Your, trade in, your ideal trade and vendor definition is the following. It's a person or company who finds their needs fulfilled with the client services that you provide, your method of operations, and who has an appreciation and respect for your skills and knowledge. More so, an ideal trade and vendor is a person or company that you generally enjoy working with, who values your expertise, and who shares the same company and personal values that you set forth. So it's important to also have trades and vendors that align with the beliefs of your company or else you're not going to have a great working relationship. Here are some selling points with trades and vendors. The initial outreach to work together. This is when you reach out to that trader vendor. You're reaching out to them to find out if you actually want to work together. The pricing, this is important. You want to make sure that you get the best, the best pricing. Um, so you want to speak with them in a way that they understand the value that you're bringing, the type of projects that you have. You also have the client care and concern. You want to make sure that this trade and vendor also appreciates the client experience that you provide. Project issues, any issues that happen with those delays that we talked about, the quality of the final project results, and the final closeout, which is future work. So essentially, you want to wrap up every project and let them know that this worked in a certain way, that the client was happy, that you were happy, and that you can work with them in the future. I'm sorry about that dog, you guys. This is crazy. Um, the uh, I want you to also know your ideal team members. So as you're working with individual team members on your team, there are also points that you will be selling with them. So the ideal internal team member definition is a person who finds their needs fulfilled with your company vision, your methods of operation, and who has an appreciation and respect for your skills and knowledge. More so, an ideal internal team member is a person possessing humility, an eagerness to learn, and an intellectual knowledge of your industry while having a common sense that aligns with your company values. And here are points when you will be selling to a team member. When you hire that team member, you have to sell them on your company. You have to sell them on the beliefs of your company and how you operate your company. Anytime you're introducing new company policies, you're also selling to your internal team members. Compensation, that's a big one. You want to be able to offer compensation that they appreciate and you want to be able to compensate them and let them know why you're paying them a certain, a certain value, a certain rate. Um, internal personnel issues, are the, is the team getting along? Are they working well together? You want to be able to fix that if not. Also increase in company workload and delegation of tasks. ABS, always be selling. We're going to turn that into APS, autopilot selling. <laughs> So autopilot selling is just turning on this sales mindset that you have and making sure that you're always doing it, whether you're trying or not, you're being that consummate salesperson and all the ways that we're talking about today will help you to keep that on autopilot. So set your selling on autopilot and let's talk about ways that you can do that. First, be honest, be transparent, be clear. This is the backbone of our entire company. This is the backbone of how we operate our, our company within our clients, within our trades and vendors, and then within ourselves. So always be honest, always be clear, and always be transparent when you're speaking with someone. It will never, ever hurt you to, it will never come back to bite you, I should say, if you're being honest and transparent because you're not having to cover anything up. You're, being, you're standing in your truth and you're letting them know exactly um, what's going on and the truth of that. And you'll never have to apologize for the truth. Three Ps, personality, positivity, and proof. So have personality on a sales call, have personality in any sales situation, be lively, be excited, be energetic. This is your company, right? This is how you are putting yourself out there to the world. So you, of all people, should have the most excitement when it comes to your company. 
Um, positivity is something that is contagious. I love it. I love um, when people express their positivity. No one wants a downer, especially when you're on a sales call and trying to convince someone of something. So always be positive. And then proof. Use the proof of your past experiences, proof of successes that you've had, accomplishments. Show the client, show the person that you're speaking with that you do have the ability to make this a success. Um, know what you're selling. And this sounds kind of rudimentary, but you should know your product, know your services. If you're offering services to someone that are different than what other people offer, you need to know those backwards and forwards. So know exactly what you're selling and know the ins and outs of that. Know your special sauce and sell that. What sets you apart? Again, as we spoke about earlier, what sets you apart from other people? What makes you different? Sell that, sell that special sauce that only you have. And that should start, by the way, on your website. Selling starts on your website. It starts on your blog. It starts on your email, your newsletter, all the things that you do. Um, selling starts there. So when you're sell have your selling on autopilot, you don't even have to think about it. When you're honest and clear and transparent and you're giving all of these things to everyone who's listening, it just happens naturally. Um, no, uh, be organized. Let them know that you actually have systems and processes. Hopefully you do. And SOPs in your company. And organization is also one of those things that has allowed us to sell to clients in the past and has allowed us to uh, close a deal and to clinch the deal with, with someone who was on the fence because they like the fact that we are internally organized within our company. Tradespeople like that, clients like that, and our team internally likes that as well. So if you have um, systems and processes in place that are keeping your company functioning at a high level, let people know that. This is a positive, right? Uh, also, I wanna tell you, when speaking of your company, to friends, to colleagues, to acquaintances, be, be wary of what you're saying. Like understand if you're speaking negative, if you're down, if you're having a negative feeling about it, you always wanna, again, back to that positive emotion, put positivity back out to everyone that you speak with about your company and about your team and about your trades and about your clients, because that could come back to you in a very negative way if you do not put that positivity out there in the world. So be proud of your company, be proud of your team, be proud of your past projects and the people that you work with. And lastly, continue to learn and grow. Always be willing to uh, assess the situation, find out what you did wrong, find out what you did right, do more of the right than the wrong, of course, but always be able to go back and learn from what you did. And um, I don't ever consider failing a negative thing. Failing to me is just a stepping stone to move towards success. So if you had some failures in the past, learn from those, grow from those and move on. All right, we're going to boil all this down. Now that that dog has stopped barking, <laughs> we're going to boil all of this down to the top four keys to selling. These are the four things that if you don't take away anything else from my babbling today, I want you to take these away, right? Because I think this will help you to, to always be selling on autopilot APS, right? So know your value, know what you bring to the table, know how great you are, know what you're providing, always have a value that you bring to someone. Never, ever, ever try to approach any sales situation without bringing a value to it. Never approach it as if you're just trying to get that dollar amount. You were trying to give, you were giving them something and, and letting them know what value you're bringing. And that is in turn going to turn them into a, a customer. Also, never look at any sales related situation as a, as a one off. Always think longevity. Always think about how it's going to continue to grow and grow and grow. Serve instead of sell. We talked about this. Take selling out of your vocabulary and just change it to serving. And if you go into every sell situation with a serving attitude of how you're going to accomplish something for that person, how you're going to alleviate a pain point that they have, then you are going to be able to sell them because you are serving them. Very, very simple, but it's just a little trick of the mind. And if you just change that one term, I have found that it does change the outcome of the sales call. Um, in that same uh, lane, also sell a solution, not a service. So you're, you're serving that person, but you're also providing a solution. So sell the solution to the problem, not the service that you provide. So sell that client on the fact that you are going to allow them to spend more time with their family because you're opening up the space and, and, and turning it into an open floor plan. Sell that sitting in front of the television 
uh, having dinner at the bar, at the island in the kitchen, having you know a family time in front of the television, having everybody in the same space, sell that emotion and sell that solution to that problem. Because perhaps they've told you that they're having family issues, their family doesn't want to spend time together, the kids are teenagers and all the things are happening. So sell them that solution rather than selling them on a package of design services that you all offer. So always think solution-based as we're listening intently to what they're saying. Always think solution-based versus what dollar or service you're going to give to them. And as I said before, think long-term. Don't look at anything as a one-of. Um, look at it as the kind of like the first drill of the well. And, and once you tap into it, it will supply water for years to come. I know that's kind of like you know, woo woo, but uh, think about it that way. Every single client that you have interaction with, every single person that you have interaction with, if you're positive, if you're bringing value, if you if you're if you're confident in your services, that person is just one point on this long trajectory of successful sales calls that you're going to have. So never, ever, ever look at anything as just a one and done situation. Always think long term. And, you know, don't forget clients talk and vendors talk and employees talk. And you need to make sure that every person that you speak with is is a stepping stone, right? So in a good way. So a stepping stone that will bring you to a bigger project, to uh, a better vendor relationship, to more, to, to better employees. So if you're thinking long term with everybody, you are you're you're in it for the win, and you're not in it for just a quick sale. I love this quote. I wanted to share it with you guys. Um, it really does wrap up everything that we've spoken about today. A consummate salesperson is elegant in approach, gentle in persuasion, and tender in success. Great salespeople don't gloat about how much they charge per project. Great sales is about that is about how you feel knowing you pleased your valuable client, trade, employee, team member, et cetera, and at the same time help pay your college tuition, right? So isn't that great? This is what we call warm and fuzzies for everyone. That is success. So it is literally a win-win. You are providing a value-based service to them, to whomever you're selling to, to whomever you're serving. And then that person gets the result that they need. You get the result that you need. And it is a win-win situation. That is the ultimate goal of any sales situation is to make sure that you use that consultative sales technique and that everybody has a positive outcome and that everyone gets their pain points addressed and it is a win-win uh, for us all. And then uh, that leads to referrals. That leads to great word of mouth. That leads to all those warm and fuzzies that um, Robert Hale mentioned here. So think about the warm and fuzzies as you're doing sales calls and really um, turn that sales call into a serving call. All right, you guys. That is it. We accomplished it. We have mindset management for sales. We've talked about the scarcity mindset, the abundance mindset, how to overcome that. The critical selling points for every designer. I, ho I hope uh, <laughs> you were able to pick up on that behind the dog barking. Uh, I'm going to get that neighbor when we're done. But the, uh, there are selling points that happen for, for clients and for trades and vendors and for your team members. And um, you need to just recognize those and have something that you're bringing to that meeting every time you have those. Also the APS autopilot selling, you need to set your selling on autopilot so that it becomes just second nature. Um, it's automatic. You handle every sales related situation in the same way, no matter whom you're speaking with. And then those top four keys to selling. These are just those four takeaways that I hope that you apply to every situation in uh, when you're serving someone by having a sales call. I also wanted to tell you guys, if you it is not working, um, I have a, that is weird. Um, there is a QR code, but it is not working. We will, I will try to get that up on the screen in a moment, but um, we have a, I have the PDF of this presentation that I will give to you. And it is also all the, all the slides that we have, as well as my ideal client worksheet. So as you're trying to find the uh, client who you'll be speaking with, this worksheet will help you with that. And maybe as we're answering questions, Rebecca, I can get this pulled up so that everybody can see that. I'm not sure why it's not showing. For sure. Yeah, we can do yeah. that. And we can also so um, send it out in our follow-up email to everyone too. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, so strange. Technology, right? <laughs> Technology and dogs are not our friend today. No. <laughs> thank you so um, but much, that is John. It. So yeah, so that, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, there were some really great nuggets of wisdom in there. Um, and we we can move on to, I'm, I'm actually shocked that you 
you were able to do that in 45 minutes. That was very <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Especially considering how much I talk. <laughs> Um, so now we'll move on to the question and answer period. So I will urge everyone to post their questions in that little Q&A box. Um, so we've got one right now um, from Loretta. She says, when you say transparent, what type of information do you share? Everything about how you run your company? Just wondering as I'm changing this, as I look at other companies and what they share. Um, in regards to how we run our company, I let clients know that we have an 18 step process, for instance, that we have that we that we facilitate every project. So I share everything from how we run the company to how we price our products. Um, I share how we uh, come up with their flat. We do a flat fee and I let them know how we accomplish that number as well. I, I realized a long time ago that by being transparent, I can lay my head on my pillow at night and, and not have to wonder and worry about whether someone's going to call me the next day asking a question. I can run my business in a, in a clear and transparent way. And, and clients are always appreciative of that, that we, we do share all that information. So there is oversharing, you know, you don't want to tell them all that you do want a little bit of magic in relation to the project. You do want them to know, like you did handle all of these things behind the scenes that made the project successful. So you don't have to share all the nitty gritty, but on that note too, if there is something bad going on with the project where I, it is delaying it or causing issues, I do let the client know the high level of that, but yeah, trans transparency and clarity, uh, have, have, revolutionize every single aspect of the way I operate my business. That's awesome. Okay, from Colleen, what type of deliverables and leave behinds do you recommend providing at the consultation? Ah, very good. I love this question. So we send out a what to expect for our consultations. We send out an email that says, hi, here's what's going to happen. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we need from you. Here's what we're going to do at the meeting. Um, and then I suggest leaving a menu of services. We send that out as a PDF ahead of time. But I also leave that as a takeaway. You want something that they can remember you by. Uh, it can even be, by the way, like something like a pen or a water bottle or anything like that. But as far as collateral for marketing your company, you want to remind them of why they should work with you. So in my menu of services, for instance, we have um, why, they why they should work with us. We have client testimonials. I show my team. I let them know exactly why we are the best person for them if indeed we are. So I, I, I recommend that you always kind of toot your own horn, if you will, and let people know about how great you are and remind them of that. Because if, especially if they're looking at other companies to possibly work with, you want them to be able to pick up that literature and know, yep, yep, that was a great consultation. And here are the reasons why they mentioned this to me in person. Now I have it in here in, in tangible information. I also recommend a follow-up email after the consultation to, again, sort of remind them of what was accomplished, but kind of put it in writing about next steps and that you're like, for us, we work on the scope of work instantly after the consultation. So we let clients know, thank you for this meeting. Here's what we're working on now. Here's when you can expect this. So again, back to that whole transparency and clarity thing. It, it really does pay off. Mm -hmm. That's great. And popping into their inbox after to remind them is a really great idea as well. And by the way, and by the way, do a, do a reminder to your reminder. So if you, if, if, if you don't hear back from them within like a week, add a reminder to your Asana or whatever project management system you're using to remind yourself to check back in on them because it's not the client's job to remember to call us back. It's our job to remember to reach out to them. Mm, that's a good one. Um, Loretta says, do you share your professional trade discounts? Um, we have two different ways that we, I've done every method. I knew it would get into pricing at some point. I've done every method uh, imaginable for, for, for client product pricing. We have found the best solution now is we share a percentage of it. So we have vendors that we work with who offer us great, great discounts because we've spent a lot of money with them and we worked with them for so long. So we actually share a percentage of that um, discount with them. And I let them know that. I, and I let them know this is going to save you this much money. Because again, if a client ever wants to call and say, our, by the way, our industry is not to the point of just hiding what you're paying for things. Um, it's not to the point of just where we're saying, oh yeah, this is the cost. You accept it, move on from it. We're not there yet. I wish we were. I wish we could operate like a Target or you know a big store where the price was the price. 
but we are not. I hope that we can change that. But by being transparent with my clients and if, if they want to know what we paid for something, I don't care because in my agreement um, that I always say if a client signs with us, I've done everything in my power to kind of keep them from not <laughs> signing with us. And I don't mean that negatively. <laughs> I mean that because I have very strict rules in place on how we run our company. So if they agree to these things, then my, yeah, of course, I'm going to tell them everything about how we run it. Because once again, it allows me to, to rest my head and know that I'm not going to be alarmed by somebody who is asking something that I don't know how to answer. Um, I always tell my team too, if, if a client comes to us with a question and we have not uh, given them the answer to that question, if they have that question, then we've not done our job. We should have been the person to alleviate that problem before it even became a problem. Okay. That's great. That reminds me of the conversation we had with Tana last month too. She has a very um, set guidelines in her contract about how she works and it's all laid out ahead of time. So that's a common theme that we're seeing. Yeah. Don't be scared. It's, it's not, it's, 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 there's no reason to not tell clients things. They, they, they're, they're very, they can Google anything these days. You know, I tried <laughs> to true. do, I tried to do once, you know, the whole thing where you're like, you change the name of the Laura lamp to the Lana lamp. And then, the, <laughs> and then, but you leave the words in there. That doesn't work either, by the way, because they can now search the words and find that product. So don't try to pull anything over your client's eyes. They're very <laughs> smart. They're very, they're very savvy these days. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Mar Marlea says, why do you recommend not trying to book the client on the discovery call? Um, I, I, I do recommend you book them on the consultation. I'm saying the point of the discovery call is not to turn them into a client. That, that is not the point of that because you don't know if you even want to work with them yet. You don't even know if, if it's a, if it's a good fit. For me, the consultation is where we find out if there's a chemistry, if we align on our values, if they believe the, you know, if they want to work with a company who operates the way that we do. So the goal of the discovery call is to schedule the consultation. The goal of the consultation, if you chose choose to move forward, is to turn them into a client. So it just kind of breaks it down into bite-sized chunks so that you're not stressed out that, oh my God, this discovery call has to turn into a $30,000 fee client. No, that discovery call has to turn into a consultation if you so mm. choose to move forward with it. And then the consultation has to turn into a client if you chose, if you choose to move forward. So think about it in smaller steps versus like the big goal of making everybody your, your client. Because Everybody is not your client. I have turned down clients after consultations that I have just felt were not the right fit um, for whatever reason. And again, back to transparency, I let them know what the reason was and they appreciate that. Okay, I like that approach. Do you charge for the initial consultation? 1000% yes. Do not do free consultations. Do not give them away. I know we've heard that from people, but here are the reasons why. If you go into the consultation and it is a value-based consultation where you are providing something, you're letting them know, yeah, change your countertops to this. Change your, these are, these are the best appliances that will get you the result for cooking, like restaurant quality. Um, this is the best tile for this particular part of your home because it's durable and it has a the slip coefficient, whatever. You're giving them takeaways, but don't just go in there and do a meet and greet and like, yeah, tour the home, move in, you know, walk in, walk out. That is never going to work. You have to give them something um, at the end of that consultation that they can take and apply. And I tell clients, the consultation is, you know, hopefully we end up working together, but if we don't, you got some great things that you can apply on your own. And I tell them as well, 99% of our clients do end up wanting to move forward because they see how much work goes into what we do, but you do not go into that consultation just as shaking hands and looking at the space, because that is not the way to tell a client the value that you're bringing to them. And by charging for that, it is setting the expectation for that client that they will receive something from that. And you can go on my website and look right now. I let everyone, um, again, I'm transparency, I'm straightforward on all the packages that we offer at our company. And even on the consultation, I, I let them know what they will, what they will take away. Okay. I think that's very smart. Yeah. You got to give takeaways. Yeah. And then that, that's when they start seeing the value, right? Absolutely. Value, 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 value. That's the key to everything. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> oh, awesome. So there is the working? QR code if anyone needs it. Let's see if I can just do this. There we go. Is that working now? Yeah, we can see oh. that. Okay, great. 
Okay, I want to be mindful of time here. So we've got two minutes. I'll answer the rest of the, or we'll, we'll try to answer the rest of the questions in the Q&A box. Um, so Colleen says, do you tell them what percentage you share with them on those discounts? Yeah, I do. Uh, it's, um, we do half. So it's 50. So if, if for instance, if we pay uh, $1,000 for something and the retail is 2000, the client pays 1500. I do, okay. but I also have a minimum. Um, so if they're like, oh yeah, I really have to have this from restoration hardware or you know, somewhere <laughs> like that. We do have a minimum that we charge for things that they want us to procure. Um, okay. We have done something very different with our company. I have broken up our services into creative production and project fulfillment. So creative is the things that we think of as design. And that's that's its own separate fee. The production part of it is us for us handling the procurement of those products and the ordering and the tracking, the receiving and all the things. I wrap that up into one nice little bow. So it's a percentage that is added on to every purchase. Um, we do have a minimum purchase requirement for our products. And then we also have project fulfillment. I don't call it project management. I call it project fulfillment because we are fulfilling the design. I never want to manage a pro project, manage the tradespeople. So by doing that, it sort of changed the perspective of clients and that they can see the value in the creative things that we're bringing. And I'm charging enough for my creative fees that if they move on to all the procurement and the project fulfillment, that's great. If they don't, then I've made enough off my creative fees to, to do that. Okay, awesome. What advice do you have for finding new clients in the current economic economic client? So in the current economic um, situation, I guess, recession, high inflation, et cetera. I, I don't, I, I think we're poised for it. I, we were also worried about COVID and the outcome of that. And it turned out great. I think this is very mm -hmm. similar in my opinion. Now I'm not a financial expert, but I feel that there's the, the mortgage rates are so high. People are not necessarily buying homes right now but they're going to put the money back into their homes as well. So maybe they did part one for uh, COVID times and they renovated their kitchen and now they're ready to move on to other parts of their home. I do not feel that this is going to be a negative. I think it's going to be a positive outcome for us. So I, my, my number one suggestion is, as I said here, um, and you can, again, download this, but know your ideal client, know that person inside and out, know where they shop, know what budget they have, know how they like to spend their money and speak to that person in every way possible. Speak to that person on social media, speak to that person on your website, in person, any of these things. Always speak to that person when you are doing any sort of marketing for your company. Um, in addition to that, I, I'm, I'm old school, so I think this in-person marketing is fantastic. Trades and vendors, they have lots of associations that you can go out or lots of meetings that you can attend at their showrooms. There's association meetings that you can go to. And I know those aren't clients per se, but those people will know someone who is looking for a designer and can get, um, and you can be top of mind for them. So always, this is not the time to be lazy. This is a time to really, again, toot your own horn, talk about the values that you have, talk about how great your company is. So many of us are timid and afraid to say how really good we are. Don't do that. Be, be proud of your company. Be proud of your team and what you've done and, and tell the world about that. But always speak to that um, ideal client. And when you download the ideal client worksheet here, you can actually um, identify that it's about an eight page document and you can actually go through there and figure out who your ideal client is, but always, always speak to them. Amazing. Okay. Well, thank you so much, John. This was super, super valuable. Um, and we're so happy to have had you on, on the webinar. Yeah. Thank you. I hope I sold you on selling that. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> Great. And if, if any um, of the designers today want to reach out with to you and chat about anything, any of these topics, how can they do so? Yeah. So on social media, I'm um, John McLean design on Instagram and everything else. Um, the courses are the designer within um, you, this will lead you there as well, but there's the website, the designer within.co. I have 10 module, 10 courses that I offer with bunch, lots of modules inside. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. So there's everything again, from my actual contracts that I use to all of my systems and processes, everything is on there. And I just in, in, encourage everyone to at least take a peek at it and, uh, and see if it's something for you, because I've, I've, I've truly found, you know, speaking of superpowers and things that you love, I've truly found something that I believe in so much because I've had lots of bad instances in my life and my career where I've done things the wrong way. And I don't want that to happen to anybody else in the design industry. And that's why uh, I'm doing this. So, so find me, ask me questions, DM me. I'll be happy to, to help you guys out any way possible.
Amazing. Thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, my Bye. Bye.